tonight, Alibaba's $100 billion IPO, Google Maps adds Uber, Chromebooks for everyone, and a drone truck. You really have to see to believe. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 81 for Tuesday, May 6th. 2014. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into our top story stories. Joining me now is Reed Albergati, tech reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Hey, Reed. How you doing? I am doing well, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Let's get right into this Alibaba story. Now, it, what's interesting about this is company officially filed today for their U.S. IPO, which puts the company valuation at $100 billion, which is kind of crazy, but hey, we talk about billions now. But I don't think Alibaba is a household name for even people who are interested in tech. So what's the big deal about this company and why is it so valuable? First of all, it's just huge. I mean, it has the potential of being the biggest IPO in U.S. history. And you're right. It's not an American company. It's based in China. It's sort of Amazon, Google, PayPal, all wrapped into one. It's this sort of mega company in China. And I think it really marks, you know, it's a, it's a big milestone uh, for, for the Chinese economy and shows, you know, we'll see what happens when, you know, it actually goes public. But, I mean, it, investors um, putting huge amounts of money in a Chinese company um, like this is just a, it, it's just unprecedented um, and a huge event. And our coverage on WSJD has, has been pretty comprehensive. I mean, we've got several people just doing nothing but focusing on Alibaba, which is which is just how important this is. Is there, you know, of course, it'll it'll matter a little bit more in the long term. But is this the sort of thing that that changes the course for a company like Amazon, where an Alibaba has been known as, oh, it's like Amazon, but for the Chinese market now having a U.S. presence? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a huge it's a huge deal. I mean, look, it's not. It's not something Americans are going to be using, so I, I wouldn't say it's a big competitor to Amazon if that's what you're you're asking. But you know, it definitely I think changes the landscape. It it it, it forces people to kind of look outside the U.S. market, it, you know, around the world. It it it's going to force you know, especially our eyes as reporters to think much more globally. I think after this. What about the future for the American market and a company like Alibaba? Sure, nobody's using it now, at least inside the U.S., but there's obviously opportunity for investment and shareholders. How does it change the course of Alibaba's strategy going forward in the next five years, say? Oh, I mean, I think it's, I think you're right. It's, it's absolutely significant. I mean, how U.S. investors react to this is is going to be a big question. I think are people going to be hesitant to, you know, dump a bunch of money into a Chinese company? There's a feeling that it's not there there's there's it's not as transparent. There's not as much known. Um, and I think the other the other angle that's that's fascinating is Yahoo. I mean Doug McMillan has a great story today about Yahoo's actual value um, at, you know its core company is going down close to zero. But its investment in Alibaba is so huge. I mean, it, it's it's sort of saving the company. So yeah, I believe in their last earnings report, it was kind of, it was kind of the nice part of uh, of Yahoo's total numbers was at least their their uh, investment in Alibaba, which is smaller than it used to be. Right. No, it's fascinating. But I mean, that is you could look at Yahoo as really just a almost the holding company for Alibaba now. So that's another fascinating wrinkle of the story. Well, another fascinating wrinkle is how quickly uh, Twitter shares seem to plummet uh, today. Now, this obviously has a lot to do with a sell-off of stock that was opened up. What exactly happened? Because depending on who you ask, this is either doom and gloom for Twitter, just marking the end, or just a really great time to buy Twitter stock. <laughs> yeah, it could be. If you look at Twitter's user numbers that they you know, released after the, after the first quarter, Quarter, um, it doesn't seem like it's catching on. It's not. It doesn't have that Facebook style trajectory of user base, and I think that's because it's it's so difficult to use for the average person. I mean, I don't know about you, but you know, my mom, my grandmother, they're all on Facebook. They don't know what to do with Twitter. They still don't know what to do with Twitter. So 
I think that's that's really what investors have been worried about, and the stock's been going down. But now today, when you have more insiders able to sell off stock, I think you you saw that people really are worried about this. And you know, Yori Ko has been covering Twitter for us. She has some great coverage of it today, um, also on WSJD. And we have a great chart that that shows what what happened when other companies reached this deadline, where insiders were able to dump their stocks and. You'll find, I mean, companies like Groupon had a similar kind of reaction from the insiders, but you know, Facebook, their stock actually went up. Um, so it's 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 kind of all over the map. But that chart is really telling, I think. Eighteen percent, a a a a drop in eighteen percent of Twitter stock, which is a loss of what you know, four billion dollars of its market value. Sure, this might be very temporary and have a lot to do with people who are trying to cash in on a company uh, while they have the chance. But, you know, in your best guess, sure, Twitter's had a bit of a rough couple of weeks in the stock market, but w where are we going to be a year from now? I, Twitter seems so ubiquitous to people like us who use it so much for news gathering. But does it just not have a chance to be on par with a Facebook, which has actually done pretty well as of late? Yeah, it's just it's just tough to use, and I think Twitter knows that. I think they're probably working on some new product to to make it, you know, something that can be an easier part of the everyday lives of Americans. That's really where the money is, right? I mean, Facebook is raking it in right now because they have over a billion users, and they continue to add tens of millions of users every quarter, um, and that's just that reach just makes them hugely valuable. Advertisers want to reach all those people. And, you know, there are 802 million daily active users, people who use it every day. I mean, Twitter is just a fraction of that. So if they're ever going to grow to those heights, I think they, you know, they need to really mainstream, be become a mainstream product. Reed Albergati is a tech reporter over at the Wall Street Journal. Reed, thanks for joining us. And do tell folks where they can find more of your work online. Well, you can get me at Twitter at Reed Albergati, just my full name. Mm -hmm. um, you can check out our coverage at uh, WSJD.com um, and also you just said WSJ.com and in the old, uh, the old print newspaper at your, uh, that comes to your door every morning. Yeah, of course it does. Thanks so much, Reed. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's move on to the rest of the stories in our tech feed. Let's start off with some Google Maps for iOS and Android. Got a big update today, including the ability for users who use the Uber transportation app to use the service as an option inside the Maps app. Now, currently, Google and Uber are two totally different companies. So this is kind of an interesting uh, first time that Google has provided users a third-party option outside of public transit. Google also improved its offline maps feature, and in the turn-by-turn -turn navigation section, the app now shows the distance and estimated arrival time right on the screen, plus which particular lane you might want to stay in to get to your destination as safely and comfortably as possible. It's a nice little update. I played around with it on my way to work today. On stage at the TechCrunch Disrupt Conference going on in New York today, Google's Captain of Moonshots, it's really his title, Astro Teller, spoke about Project Loon, which is the Google X project that uses stratospheric balloons to bring internet to underserved areas of the world. Now, up until this point, what was unclear was how Project Loon would use licensed or unlicensed spectrum. Now, seems we have a plan. Loon uses the spectrum that already exists in a given country. So, when a Loon balloon is over that country, the telcos will be able to lease the balloons while they pass over. Now, as a result, Google doesn't have to license the spectrum because the telcos already own it. And the project is able to offer users much more bandwidth than they would have had otherwise. Very interesting. Google Now is coming to Chromebooks, and Google will soon be releasing an app that lets you watch movies and TV offline on your Chromebook via Google Play, which the company says should arrive in the next few weeks. So with both offline document access and then movie viewing offline, the device becomes a real alternative to a Windows PC or a tablet. Speaking of Chromebooks, Intel just announced plans to roll up up to 20 new Chromebooks in the second half of this year. The new sets will be thinner, lighter, more powerful, generally more diverse, 
in terms of design and will be based on Intel's more powerful and efficient Bay Trail M system on a chip. Intel also says they'll be fanless. That's the first time a Chrome device has been fanless. And 15% lighter. Intel also introduced a little HP Chrome box desktop and announced the availability of LG's all-in-one Chrome-based computer. Lastly, Intel says that all of these new Chrome devices will be made with the world's first conflict-free microprocessors, meaning the minerals they're made from were ethically mined. Intel also announced it's introducing its first Core i3 processors designed for Chromebooks this summer. A lot of Chromebook news with Dell's Chromebook 11 and Acer's C720, both sporting the new chip under the hood. But that's not all. It's really a Chromebook bonanza today because Lenovo's announced its uncoming, upcoming N20 and N20P Chromebooks will be shipping with Celeron processors, 4 gigs of RAM, a 16 gigabyte solid state drive. Both will support Bluetooth 4.0.2, 802.11ac Wi-Fi. Battery life estimated at eight hours for each. Other features include a SD card slot, USB 3.0, a one megapixel webcam. The list goes on. Now the N20P is interesting because it has a 300 degree hinge and a touchscreen display, which makes it the first Chromebook to go beyond that standard clamshell notebook design. The N20 will sell for $279 in July. The N20P will go for $329 with availability beginning in August. All right, now for something completely different. Starting today, Tumblr is rolling out the ability to customize your blog's design across any device, which includes its iOS and Android apps. Previously, Tumblr blogs viewed via mobile had a single app-wide design, which made it look nice, but stripped them of their web themes and their customization. Tumblr, of course, owned by Yahoo, is calling these in-app customization features your mobile identity. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA's, commercial drone ban has been criticized by media organizations such as the Associated Press, the New York Times, and the National Press Photographers Association. They contest that its broad restrictions violate the First Amendment protections afforded to journalists. Now, the ban was overturned by a National Transportation Safety Board judge back in March, but the FAA is currently appealing that. In response, the news orgs have filed a brief with the NTSB asking that it affirm the judge's ruling, the one from March, and continue to block similar bans until the FAA makes an exception for the use of small drones. The brief includes, quote, reports on traffic, hurricanes, wildfires, and crop yields could all be told more safely and cost-effectively with the use of unmanned aerial vehicles, and that, quote, lower cost aerial photography would help more newsrooms across the country bring more accurate and useful information to the public. The brief also notes that the FAA does make exceptions for journalists in other circumstances already, like into areas that have temporary flight restrictions. All right, finally, speaking of drones, it's a truck, it's a helicopter, it's a drone. That's actually all three. Advanced Tactics has released the very first video showing its Black Knight Transformer flying through the desert somewhere anyway. The Transformer is designed to cruise along at about 150 miles per hour, that's its top speed, in the air on autonomous medical evacuation and resupply missions. Now, when it's back on the ground, the Transformer can be driven pretty much just like a normal truck or a tank, or whatever you want to call it. It's like the El Camino of the future. I made that part up. They didn't say that. Before we go, a little calendar item. Microsoft is holding what it calls a small Surface event on May 20th. The company has reportedly been working on a miniature version of its Surface tablet for nearly two years, and rumors have pegged the device as possibly 7.5 inches, maybe a 1440 by 1080 display with a 4.3 aspect ratio and a Qualcomm processor under the hood to run... Windows RT probably rather than full Windows 8, but we'll find out in a few weeks. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show if you would at twit.tv slash TNT if you want to. And write us at TNT at twit.tv. Don't miss Tech News Today. That's tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'll be back here tomorrow. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.